Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our last two sessions of the day. We're going to start with two talks about certificates, and our first speaker is going to be Tyla. All right. Good afternoon, everybody, and I want to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. It really is lovely to be here. So who in this room uses the web on a daily basis? And we use it for a number of different things, don't we? To conduct online sensitive transactions, online banking, online shopping, to connect to our nearest and dearest. But why do we trust the web? I would argue that we trust the web for some definition of trust, because we have TLS that works in combination with a public key infrastructure, a PKI. Now, I know a fair bit about TLS, but I've always sort of taken this PKI component for granted. And at Mozilla, as a browser vendor, we obviously care a lot about this component because problems in the web PKI mean problems for every single user on the web. Now, most people should be fairly familiar with how the web PKI works. We have these things called digital certificates, and they map an entity's identity to its public key. And they are issued by certificate authorities, or CAs. Now, at the top of this chain, we have a root CA, and it acts as a trust anchor. And its certificate is embedded in the root store of a browser. Now, there might be a number of intermediate CAs along the way before an end entity certificate is issued. And at each stage, the appropriate digital signature is added. And this is effectively how we create a chain that leads all the way back to the root. And this is how we inject trust into the web. But what if something goes wrong? It's estimated that over 500,000 private keys were leaked because of the Heartbleed vulnerability. And estimates vary, so it's probably a lot more than 500,000 private keys. And what does this mean? Well, this means that an attacker could successfully man in the middle your TLS connection and decrypt the current session, or an attacker could impersonate a server, or perhaps even decrypt past sessions. So this is bad. Now, what should happen when a private key gets compromised? Well, the corresponding digital certificate that relates to the public key should be revoked. So the owner of that certificate should request revocation. And the issuing CA should produce a public, cryptographically verifiable attestation that the certificate should no longer be trusted. And the onus is on the client to check the revocation status of the certificates that it receives. So revocation on the web is really, really important. But revocation in the wild is broken. And what I want to do over the next 35 minutes or so is talk about current methods for revocation checking on the web and why they don't really work in the browser ecosystem. Then I want to talk about CR Lite, which is a new way of doing things. And this was an idea that was actually born in academia. Then I want to talk about how we're translating this idea for use in Firefox. And specifically, I want to talk about what it's taken to build this thing, where we are now, and we'll also consider whether or not we're done yet, a question in crypto engineering which often has the resounding answer of no. Uh, if there's time, I'd also like to talk about what it means for an academic idea to take root in industry and whether or not initiatives like this are helping us to move towards a more robust web PKI. So what methods currently exist for revocation checking on the web? Well, there are certificate revocation lists, CRLs, and these are just lists of revoked certificates that are produced and signed by the relevant CA. When a CA issues a certificate, it includes a URL to its CRL in the certificate, and it's up to the client to download the CRL and check for revocation status of the certificate that it has just received. But these things can grow to multiple megabytes before a page can load. So they slow down the connection. They add latency. So we don't really like CRLs, and we don't make use of them in Firefox. Then there's the Online Certificate Status Protocol, or OCSP. This allows a client to query the revocation status of a single certificate by sending an OCSP request to a CA's OCSP responder. It receives the response which is signed by the CA, so it can trust this response. Now, in theory, this should be better. But these things fail often. They're very unreliable. They add latency to the connection. And there are also privacy concerns. 
because they leak the information about the domains to which the client is connecting. So what you may have noticed up until now is that the client is doing a lot of the hard work for revocation checking. But what if we shift this work to the server? And this is what happens in OCSP staple. So the server is responsible for sending an OCSP request to an OCSP responder, receiving the response and stapling it or attaching it to a certificate that it is going to serve. Now this is a bit better, it addresses the latency, it addresses privacy concerns, but it's not quite perfect because an attacker can easily strip off an OCSP response and happily fail open their way to victory. And what does this mean? This means that of all of the methods that I've just described, if they don't work, if the client cannot determine the revocation status of the certificate, it goes ahead with the connection anyway. If it were to fail closed, on the other hand, it would terminate the connection as soon as it could not determine revocation status. And that's why we really like OCSP must staple. This is a TLS extension which signifies to the client that it will be receiving an OCSP response. If that OCSP response is not present, it immediately terminates the connection. The problem with OCSP must staple, though, is that it's not widely deployed on the web, and many hosts don't actually support stapling. So, of all of the methods that I've just described that are deployed at scale, there are problems. They add delays, they add latency to the connection. They fail open, and there are privacy concerns. But what if we could push all revocation information to all clients? We might not need to fail open, and we would address the privacy concerns. Now, there are some initiatives in the space. Google has CRL sets, and Mozilla has one CRL, in which we push partial revocation information to clients. We don't push all revocation information to clients. Why not? I'll let you think about that for a minute. There are also other methods that have been suggested for distributing revocation information, and one of them includes using FM radio to do this. Uh, I really don't think that all clients are going to install FM receivers, but, uh, you know, it's a cute idea in theory. So why don't we send all revocation information to clients? Well, the issue is size. It matters, and this is a lot of information. And this is where CR Lite comes in. CR Lite aims to compactly and efficiently get all revocation information to all clients. And it does this by making very clever use of Bloom filters. Now, because of initiatives like certificate transparency and internet scanning, we have a very good view of the certificate ecosystem. So CR Lite takes this view and takes all of this information and puts it in a data structure that supports the queries to the finite set of unexpired certificates. And this is how it gets all revocation information to all clients. So, as a reminder, a Bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure that allows for the insertion of arbitrary sized elements. We need a bit array of size M, and we need K hash functions for mapping to array indices. Now, this is a very contrived example for the purposes of illustration. So say now we want to put data item D into the filter. Well, we do this. We compute H1 of D. This gives us 4. So we set the bit in index 4 to 1. We compute H2 of D. This gives us 11. So we set the bit in index 11 to 1. And we keep going, setting the bit in index 9 to 1 and the bit in index 2 to 1. But what if I want to put another data item into the filter? It might look something like this. And you might be able to see that there's a purple bit up there, and that's because both of these data items have collided on this index, and that is very, very possible. So how do we check if an item is in this filter? If any of the HID star values for an item D star is zero, then it's definitely not in the filter. If all of those HID star values is one, then it might be in the filter. So maybe it's a legitimate insertion, but maybe it's not. So we are going to have false positives, and the false positive rate P is determined by M, K, and the occupancy of the filter. Now, going forward, we're going to think about the set R, which is the set of revoked certificates, and the set S, which is the set of unrevoked certificates, and together they make up the finite set U of unexpired certificates. So say now we want to store the set R into a Bloom filter. Well, we can do that, but there are going to be false positives. 
But what if we take those false positives and we store them in another Bloom filter? And this is the idea of cascading Bloom filters, and this is what CR Lite makes use of. So we do something like this. We start with the set R, and we put it into Bloom filter number one. But there are going to be false positives. These are the elements of S that should not be in Bloom filter one. But we can find those false positives, and we put them into another Bloom filter, Bloom filter number two. Again, there are going to be false positives. And these are the elements of R that shouldn't be in Bloom filter number two. We can find these false positives and put them in yet another Bloom filter. And we keep going until we can't find any more false positives and we don't need another Bloom filter. Now, because we've worked with the finite set U, we're in a position to determine whether or not an element is in R, whether or not a certificate has been revoked. If a data item is not in the first Bloom filter, then it is not in R. If it is in the first Bloom filter, then we don't know. So we move on to the next Bloom filter. If it is in the first Bloom filter, but not in the second Bloom filter, then it is in R, because it means it's not a false positive, so it's a legitimate element of R. If it's in both of them, then we don't know, and we move on to the next layer. If an item is in Bloom filter one and Bloom filter two, but not in Bloom filter three, then it's not in R, because we actually confirm it to be a false positive. It's actually part of the set S. If it is in all of the Bloom filters for a three-level cascade, then it is in R. So you can almost think about these even-numbered filters as acting as strike lists for R. They contain all of the elements that are not really in R, but have made their way into the filter. So there is a simple method for checking out whether a certificate is revoked. So if we look at a certificate U, we start with I is equal to one, and we keep going until U is not in Bloom filter I. If I is odd, then it's not in R, it's not revoked. If it's even, then it is in R. If U is in all of the Bloom filters, in all of the BFI, then we look at the number of levels in our Bloom filter. And if the number of levels is odd, then it is in R. If the number of levels is even, then it's not in R. Now this does make sense, and you might want to think about it for a minute, but um, in case you need it, I have created this diagram. So you start with the questions of what Bloom filter this is in. So is it in Bloom filter one? Is it in Bloom filter two? Is it in Bloom filter three? And you make decisions accordingly. Now we obviously want the minimum possible size of this cascaded Bloom filter. Now a single Bloom filter is minimized when K is this value and M is that value. But for filter cascades, the question becomes, how do we choose P so that we have the minimum possible size? Now the authors of the CR Lite paper did some analysis, and they found that it was optimal to choose P1 for the first layer of the Bloom filter, and P for all of the other Bloom filters. And we set P1 to be this, and P depends on the size of R, the size of S, and the false positive rate P. And when P is equal to a half, we get close to a theoretical lower bound for the size of this Bloom filter. The authors did a few simulations in the paper and they confirmed this, and they also state that this cascaded Bloom filter doesn't grow considerably with the size of S. It actually grows with the size of R, which is good. So in terms of the CR Lite architecture, there are two entities that you need to keep in mind. There's the client that needs to get these Bloom filters and check for revocation. Then there's the CR Lite aggregator, which is responsible for creating these Bloom filters and getting this information to clients. Now, I've shamelessly stolen this picture from the academic paper, and this is the academic architecture. And you can see on the left, they're using certificate scans or internet scans and certificate transparency to, make, to get a view of the certificate ecosystem. Then from that, they construct their sets R and S, and they make use of CRLs and OCSP responses. Then they put R into this filter cascade, this multi-level filter, and they produce a daily filter file, which in the academic setting has a size of 10 megabytes, and they also produce a delta update file, which has a size of about 0.5, 0.6 megabytes. And this delta update file is the difference between yesterday's filter and today's filter. So if a client downloaded a filter yesterday, it doesn't have to download the entire filter again, it just downloads the update. You might also notice that there are audit log files, 
And these are present so that any external party can confirm that the bloom filter or the cascade has been constructed correctly. And in the academic setting, the client actually has to go and fetch these filter files, the daily file as well as the delta file. Now at Mozilla, we realized that Sierra Lite was gonna help us do things the Mozilla way. We care a lot about privacy, and the reduction in latency would also be great. So this is a slide I took from one of the Sierra Lite engineers, and it's from about 18 months ago, when the team was deciding whether or not Sierra Lite would be good for Firefox. And the reasons as to why it would be good is because it has CR-like properties, it has small data sizes which are fast to pass, it allows for incremental updates, it's going to scale well, and it builds on the useful properties of certificate transparency. So our architecture looks something like this, and we actually only make use of certificate transparency to get a view of the certificate ecosystem, because we think this gives us a pretty good view. We then construct our set R, and we only make use of CRLs. We don't use OCSP for this because OCSP is unreliable and it's slow. We then construct our filter cascade and produce our daily filter file, which at the moment is about 1.4 megabytes. Our delta update files are 0.4 megabytes, and we actually want to distribute these things four times a day and not only once a day. We also have the architecture for signing and pushing these things to clients. So that's already part of our system. We didn't have to think about building that. Now the academic paper did have a prototype and they built it as a Firefox extension. And in the academic paper, they had to make use of TLS JavaScript APIs for certificate checking. And JavaScript can be slow and can be quite cumbersome. In our situation, we can make this native to the browser and we're using C++, Rust, and a little bit of JavaScript. Now the academic paper cites 10 milliseconds to check a certificate chain, and for us to check one certificate against Sierra Light on a local machine is about 0.04 milliseconds, but we're coming in at under eight milliseconds if we take all of our Firefox calls into account. So we only use Sierra Light to check for end NTC certificate revocation. We still make use of one CRL for checking the revocation status of intermediate certificates. So we haven't discarded that mechanism. So up until now, I've given you a very broad, very high level overview of our system architecture. But we actually had to go about and build these components for Firefox. And that meant that we had to create our aggregator to produce filter files. We had to write the client side code for the checking of these filter files. And we also had to link all of this up to our remote settings infrastructure to push these files to clients. And trust me, these are not simple steps. If you just think about step one, there are over two billion entries in the certificate transparency logs. And all of those have to be processed at least once by our aggregator. And we need to use this information to create the sets S and R. And S, if you remember, is the set of unexpired, unrevoked certificates, and R is the set of unexpired but revoked certificates. And one of our engineers, JC Jones, has been working on this, and he recently said to me, it's hard, Tyler, it's just plain hard. So initially we did all of our testing and our experimentation on a single high-performance server with a very large disk drive. In some ways, development in the setting is easier because you have only one environment to worry about but it required constant monitoring, particularly when we're getting close to running out of space. So our cloud op team, in their infinite wisdom, said, well, why don't you make use of external storage mechanisms for all of this data? So we now take certificate transparency data and we use Google's Firestore, it's in the cloud, to store relevant certificate information, and we make use of a Redis cache to store these certificate identifiers that are actually going to go into our Bloom filters. Now, getting something of this nature to work had a lot of teething problems from choosing Redis cache sizes and dealing with a slowdown as these sets grew to encountering Golang timeouts uh, with the Firestore. So it really was a learning curve for us, and we expected this. But JC, being the wonderful engineer that he is, persisted. And we now have a, so an aggregator architecture that looks like this. We're making use of Kubernetes that is running in the Google Cloud Platform. 
And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we have components for processing our CT logs. We have jobs that can create these filters. We can store these filters. And then we have components that are responsible for publishing these filters, for sending them out to our remote settings infrastructure, which will eventually get it to our clients. Now, JC has very kindly put together some performance graphs for our infrastructure. And this is CPU usage of our Kubernetes cluster for filter generation. And each of these peaks corresponds to a generation run. And you can see that even at the top peak over there, we're not even close to capacity. We're at less than 25% of allocatable CPU. Now, in terms of how long it takes to actually build these filter files on our infrastructure, to create these sets R and S takes us on average about 35 minutes. And to actually produce these filter files, these cascaded filters that we're going to send to clients, we're at about 20 minutes on our infrastructure. Now, some of the other steps were easier to navigate, but they did present a few bumps. So writing our client-side code was delayed by waiting on other Mozilla teams to provide Rust bindings for us. So this slowed down our development there. And linking up to our remote settings infrastructure didn't present too much of a problem, but it has raised an interesting process question for us. Typically, our remote settings infrastructure isn't used all that often, once a day, maybe less. But now we want to make use of this thing four times a day, and we wanted to, to do it in a highly automated fashion. So we're going to have to work with our remote settings team to get this working to send our deltas four times a day. So hopefully I've given you a small sense of what it's like to try and build this thing for use in a production environment. So where are we now? Uh, towards the end of last year, we landed a very basic functional prototype of Sierra Light in Firefox Nightly. And Nightly is the highly experimental version of our browser. And we landed it in telemetry only mode. And what does this mean? This means that we don't actually make use of Sierra Light for revocation checking. We still make use of OCSP. But when OCSP runs, we also do a check against Sierra Light to compare the difference in the results, particularly in terms of speed. Now, this chart, we're seeing some very basic telemetry on whether or not this thing is actually working. So we have a big sample, which we collected over a 12-day period in December. The sample runs into the millions. And you can see that about 10% of the time, the filter was not available. And this was actually very useful information to us because it pointed to a problem in our push infrastructure in getting these filter files to clients. So some clients were not receiving these filter files, and this is something that we're investigating. Then for over 60% of the time, the issuer was not enrolled. And that's something that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Some of the time, the certificate was too new. It wasn't captured by Sierra Light. And in this instance, you really do have to rely on traditional methods, like OCSP for revocation checking. So for about 15% of the time, Sierra Light found valid unrevoked certificates. And although it's not graphically represented, there were 289 revocation hits using Serialite, where Serialite correctly identified revoked certificates. Now, recall that I'd say we were running this thing in telemetry-only mode. And particularly, we're looking at the difference between Serialite and OCSP and how much faster Serialite is than OCSP. And this is that information. And you can see some of the time, it's not faster than OCSP. Some of the time, the difference is around zero milliseconds. Um, but we do have a median difference of about 125 milliseconds. And we're seeing some very interesting behavior in the tail over here. And this is the effect of the one second timeout of OCSP. So for over 10% of the time, OCSP is timing out, but CR Light is very quickly getting to a result. And then there's some more information here later on. And maybe this is when OCSP isn't timing out or OCSP has a much longer timeout. So Serialite is faster than OCSP. This is what we expected, but it has been nice to be able to confirm this and with our very functional prototype. So there are a few technical caveats that I need to mention. We don't currently catch the Let's Encrypt entries in our filter. And this is because Let's Encrypt isn't making use of CRLs. This is likely to change, or we hope it's going to change in the near future. So all of the Let's Encrypt entries will be in our filter, but for now, they're not. And because of that, there's some extra computation time because the client actually needs to determine whether or not it can use CRLite for revocation checking. 
Sometimes it won't be able to, and then it has to fall back to OCSP. So we're not fully fail closed yet. And I do want to stress that we are still in prototype mode. So no, we're not done yet. <laughs> now, in terms of security, there was a brief security analysis section in the academic paper. But a lot of the paper was set aside to describe how the system functioned. Now, I spoke briefly about this work at one of our Mozilla summits. And afterwards, Tom Shrimpton, who's with us, came up to me and engaged me in discussing some work that he and his students were doing on the use of probabilistic data structures in adversarial environments. And we started talking about how this work might relate to the CR light setting. At the same time, Kenny Patterson informed me that he'd set a student to work on looking at attack scenarios and threat models for CR light. And we are fortunate to be in communication with both of these groups, and I hope they're going to join forces. And we're still also working with the Sierra Light academic team, particularly Christo Wilson and Dave Lemon. And my hope is that we're all going to be able to work together to make Sierra Light as robust as possible before it hits a production-ready state. So specifically, we want to look at some deeper security questions and attack scenarios. We want to stress test this thing. What's going to happen when we size it with very big sets and what happens to the p-values at all of these levels, and this is something Kenny has been thinking about, we also need to make sure that we've got enough crypto agility. What if we need to upgrade our hash functions very quickly? Will we be able to do that in our system? We want to look at some architecture enhancements, and currently the engineering team is looking at how to produce smaller delta files and what's the best method of compression and what's the best method of getting those delta files so that they can be usable. So we really do want to make CR Lite as safe as possible before it is going to be used in full-scale production. So I think a project like this has a lot of nice collaboration between academia and industry. And I think that both spheres have contributed equally. The idea was born in academia. It, it was designed as an academic idea. We now have an industry team that's building this thing for use at scale. And there are more academic teams that are going to help refine this thing further to make sure that it is going to be as safe as possible for our users. So what has it been like taking an idea like this with the intention of landing it in Firefox? As I said earlier, we felt that CR Lite was going to help us do things the Mozilla way, so the idea tracked well. And the fact that there was already a Firefox extension helped us. But the paper couldn't, and it didn't, take into account our existing infrastructure. And in our case, the existing infrastructure helps because we have this mechanism for already signing and pushing these filter files out to clients. And I also think that the timing for a solution like this is good. CR Lite can exist because of enhancements in other tools, particularly certificate transparency. So for us, the process of taking this academic idea and trying to get it ready for production looks something like this. It started as an intern project, and after the internship ended, there was some further development, and we now have a very basic functioning prototype. And over the next couple of months, or however long it takes, we're going to refine it. And then after that, we're going to decide on production plan for Serolite and how much we'll actually be able to rely on it for revocation checking in our clients. So when I asked one of the Serolite engineers what he thought about the system and the entire process, he said, it's an excellent solution to a problem we shouldn't have. And this is interesting, because we have mechanisms like must staple, which work really well for revocation checking on the web, but they are not deployed at scale. And I think the reasons for that go beyond engineering, so I don't particularly want to open that can of worms right now. But it does raise interesting questions for the web PKI. The web PKI is undoubtedly fundamental in establishing trust on the web, but it's very, very fragile. And are systems like this going to help us move towards a more robust web PKI? I definitely think that it's going to help. Uh, and I really do believe that the relationship between academia and industry is important. I think that by harnessing this relationship, together we can build stronger and safer systems. And to drive that point home, I want to let you hear from some of the people who are doing the hard work on Sierra Light. And I have a video, so let's hope that the video guards are with us. 
Then we started working on CRL Lite. There had been a long history of developing new techniques for transmitting revocation data. Unfortunately, the general consensus amongst everyone in the PKI was that there was no way to transmit revocation data to all clients uh, without consuming way too much bandwidth. But we were determined, we figured there has to be a better way because the PKI demands it. The spec says that every client has to check for revocations. Uh, really only with the advent of certificate transparency logs did it finally make a solution possible. So in a funny way, the same folks who had said it was impossible to check for revocations were the ones who gave us the ingredients that finally made it possible. After our paper was published, Mozilla reached out to us to include CRLite into Firefox, which as an academic has just been a crazy, amazing opportunity. I think the reason they ultimately decided to pick it up was because they had folks who were simultaneously writing the TLS 1.3 spec, which says all clients have to check for revocations, while at the same time making a client that they knew wasn't always checking for revocations. So I think they realized that no browsers were faithfully implementing the protocol, but that with CRL Lite, it would finally give them the opportunity to do so. The question we had was whether we could meet the necessary preconditions in the real world for CR Lite's uh, guarantees to hold true. Could we tell if a certificate was going to be in the filter? Could we tell if an issuing certificate authority was behaving properly? And even with answers to those questions, we still had to prove out that we could build a robust infrastructure for a notoriously not robust web PKI. And that took most of 2019. So while we were implementing this, we were discussing it at the security summits that Mozilla runs and piqued the interest of other academic teams who could help us validate the security properties of the production system. I think it's great to see a system that makes clever use of probabilistic data structures making its way into an industry product. But it's really crucial to get the security aspects of such a system right before it hits full-scale production. And I think there's still some work to do here, but I'm really looking forward to working with Mozilla on that. So as I've said, we're very fortunate to be working with these academic teams to help get it robust before we deploy it. And um, I really think that this is going to be a fruitful collaboration going forward. So thank you to all of you for listening. And I want to thank everybody who is involved in the CR Lite project, who has been involved, who may be involved. And do go and check out our CR Lite blog posts. They should be live right now. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, two, two quick uh, related questions. The first one, I'm just curious, kind of from afar, uh, you chose to use this cascaded bloom filters, mm. which is not, I mean, it's related to bloom filter, but it's not the most standard structure. There is the like cuckoo hashing and so on. Uh, is there a particular reason why you happen to choose uh, this one? We chose this one because the academic paper chose this one. They do have a small footnote in the paper saying, oh, you could use other filters or other data structures. And I think it's an interesting question to see if other data structures are actually going to be better for an application like this. So I think this has been a question that has already been raised. Okay, and I guess very quickly, can you, you I assume you support like addition and you know, like new certificates and yes. so on, so it's, it's all okay. Yes, yes. Um, hi, similar to the uh, previous question on the data structure, um, it sounds like with the cascading bloom filters, the whole probabilistic nature of the filter is gone because you have to keep doing that till you have no false positives. And I was wondering if things like a Radix tree or other data structures have been considered uh, for storing the certificate. Yes, yeah, there have been other data structures considered. As I said previously, we just went with what was in the paper, but I think there might be other data structures that could be better. Uh, super cool talk. I love blue filters. They're great. Um, approximately how big is your set of revoked certificates you're working with? Ah, uh, good question. This is in our blog post. Um, I think at the moment we only have about 700,000 in there because we don't have the whole Valets Encrypt entries. Thanks. Hi, so you mentioned that you expect the Let's Encrypt situation to change. Is that because you're going to start checking OCSP or require CAs to uh, publish CRLs or something else? I think we're hoping that um, Let's Encrypt is going to start using CRLs. Because okay. we want to make use of CRLs because we find OCSP slow and unreliable to use for construction. All right, thanks. And uh, one other question. What's the um, input to the, what's stored in the Bloom filters? Is it a thumbprint? Right, yes. It's um, a hash, a SHA-256 hash value of a serial number and some other data. 
and it's concatenated with, again, some um, uh, certificate-specific information. It's, I can't remember the exact format right now, but it is in our blog posts of what it is. All right, thanks. Um, so my question is, do you see this as replacing, as, as a sort of intermediate step before we have OCSP must staple, or do you see this replacing uh, OCSP must staple? And I'd like to just say I'm a bigger fan of this. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think OCSP must staple, the idea has been around for a while and it hasn't seen much uptake. I don't know if that situation is going to change. So we're sort of thinking about this as more of a replacement. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Could you speak briefly to the big uh, bar on the bar chart, the 60% of requests or certs where the issuer wasn't enrolled? Yes, that's because we don't have Let's Encrypt data in our Bloom filter, and a lot of that data is that 60%. Yet, we don't have it yet. Have you looked at the bandwidth requirements of OCSP, must staple, the size that that adds to each request by each client versus the size of the uh, CRL light um, delta um, updates and how it may actually be more advantageous in terms of the, of the demand on the network for CRL light versus OCSP uh, must staple? Right, I, I don't know what the, the difference is there, but it yeah, could be more advantageous with CR Light, yeah. Okay, thanks. Let's thank Tyler again. Our next speaker is Dan Shumo, who asked me to mispronounce his name. <laughs> so, uh, Don Shumov. That's okay. good. Nadia offered to mispronounce my name. Uh, so, I'm here to ask uh, the question of whether or not certificate thumbprints are unique and hopefully answer that as well. This is a project uh, done by Greg Zavarusha and myself. Uh, on the Microsoft Research Security and Cryptography team. So before we get into it, uh, I figured it'd be prudent to talk about what certificate thumbprints are. Um, you may not have come across them unless you're implementing something or analyzing uh, certificates. Um, so certificate thumbprints are just simply a hash of the whole certificate ASN1 structure, including the to be signed part as well as the signature. Um, and what's, Im what's really important to note here is that the thumbprint hash does not necessarily, uh, it's not the, it's necessarily the same as the signature hash. And um, thumbprints still may use MD5 or SHA-1. So they're essentially just identifiers for certificates, a more concise identifier. Uh, they're displayed in interfaces, config files, they can be used to refer to certificates in code. Um, and they're sometimes similar to a ha the way a hash is used in a hash table. So thumbprints are a, a cryptographic hash, but they're not really considered a core security feature in the same way that like the signature hash is. So um, if you're gonna take anything from this, the TLDR is uh, that thumbprints are aliases for certificates. Um, this work answers the question of um, certificate uniqueness, first by defining the properties we would want um, for this uniqueness, and then using these uh, definitions to determine that thumbprint, thumbprints are not, in fact, unique. Uh, this ain't CSI, folks, this is cryptography, so we have to be a little more careful with our thumbprints. We didn't find any way to exploit this um, or any evidence that it was being used in practice either. So now if you want to tune out, uh, you can. So uh, thumbprint uniqueness, uh, um, like 
Given that thumbprints are used as identifiers for certificates and uh, implemented with cryptographic hashes, it begs the question if they are unique, um, especially given that they may be using MD5 or SHA-1. Um, and furthermore, because they're not really considered this core security uh, feature function, uh, we've encountered devs pushing back on us when we've said, hey, you should uh, migrate away from these weaker hash functions. So that caused us to ask these questions. So to the best of our knowledge, this work is the, f um, the first place where any sort of properties about um, the certificate uniqueness have been introduced. So informally, the two, uh, the, there are two properties that we want from certificates, that uh, certificate thumbprints that identify both uh, directions of uniqueness that we would have. So uh, property U1 is that no two uh, different certificates uh, should have the same thumbprint, and then in the other direction that a thumbprint should uniquely identify a certificate. So uh, this property U1, that different certs shouldn't have the same thumbprint. Um, you know, as this is a hash of the certificate, uh, collision resistance is going to be enough to guarantee this U1 uniqueness. But in practice, because MD5 and SHA-1 are used, that may not be the case. So we'll actually show how a certificate issuer can create two certificates with the same thumbprint. Um, however, this is slightly more complex than a uh, collision attack because the thumbprint is computed over the whole certificate, including the signature. So this property U2 is that a certificate should have a unique thumbprint associated with it. Um, so if the certificate is held constant, then changing the thumbprint means modifying the signature for a given cert and as such, this U2 property is related to both strong unforgeability of the CA signing algorithm and also encoding malleability. And this property in particular has uh, an implication for security um, in uh, certificate revocation lists, uh, like the last talk that we saw. Um, so, to uh, demonstrate how we can break this U2 property, um, I have here the PEM for a certificate that has uh, two different thumbprints. Um, this is because ECDSA is cryptographically malleable. You just re-sign, generating a new blinding value that will generate a new signature, and then you'll have two different thumbprints. Um, RSA is not cryptographically malleable because of padding, um, but the ASN1DR encoding can be mangled um, in a way to modify to create different thumbprints. So specifically, the way this works is you have a cert laid out like a TBS certificate, a signature algorithm, uh, and then a signature value. This signature algorithm is an algorithm identifier sequence, uh, the second field of which is optional. So there are two different ways that this could be encoded, with a null type uh, or just without the field. So the X509 uh, standard specifies that signature algorithm must match the signature field of the TBS certificate, um, but uh, this is not actually enforced in Windows. Uh, we'd like to thank the anonymous reviewer who pointed that out to us. Um, so in some cases, you may find that you can uh, uh, exploit this. So, and we did, in fact, find certificates in the wild with this difference. So now on to creating colliding thumbprints. That's breaking that U1 property. So certificate thumbprints still often use SHA-1. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's not exactly clear whether a collision attack alone can be used to create colliding thumbprints um, because of the extra structure with the signature. So uh, what we did is we used an MD5 chosen prefix collision attack because when we did this work, uh, SHA-1 
uh, chosen prefix collisions were not feasible, as that was just demonstrated earlier today for the first, or presented earlier today for the first time. So uh, we actually additionally required a key substitution attack to create colliding thumbprints. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of key substitution attacks. You can see those in our paper if you would, uh, if you're interested. But I'll just say that essentially every X509 certificate in use today is signed with an algorithm that allows a key substitution attack on it. And so what we demonstrate is how uh, a CA or a certificate issuer can create two certificates with the same MD5 thumbprint. So what's going on here and why we need more than just a collision attack is because certificates are laid out with a pre-signature part, the TBS uh, certificate, and then the signature after that. So if you did the collision in this uh, P part of the cert, uh, the signature would change because the signature signs a cryptographically strong hash. So what that means is that additionally, uh, the attacker is gonna have to control the signature as well. So to sort of uh, give the high level layout of how this attack would work, the attacker wants to uh, create a certificate with the same thumbprint as a honest uh, certificate C1. So the attacker first is going to execute a hash collision attack, um, creating a colliding block, um, and insert that into the SKI of uh, their malicious cert C2. Then the attacker is going to compute uh, the signing hash of their modified cert uh, and signature, uh, sorry, their modified cert and uh, SKI, um, and then they'll use a key substitution attack to sign this new hash and create a matching signature T. Then they'll go back and get a cert issued for their, uh, the key that they generated with the key substitution attack. And uh, they'll have a valid cert that will verify uh, in, the, in the PKI. So, after we demonstrated this, uh, we scanned for colliding thumbprints uh, in the wild. We did, we did this by getting data sets from Project Sonar uh, published at scans.io. Uh, this represented 125.8 million unique certificates. And uh, what we did there was we computed thumbprints uh, and looked for certificates that may have the same MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-256 thumbprints. We didn't find any. Uh, we ran MD5 and SHA-1 collision detection, did not detect anything there. And we also additionally looked for key substitution attacks uh, by looking for certificates with matching signatures. And we did in fact find several certificates with matching signatures, but on closer inspection, none of these appeared to be created with key substitution attacks. So uh, in short, we found no evidence of, of colliding thumbprints or any uh, of these attacks. So while checking for key substitution attacks, we actually found something interesting. Greg found something interesting, particularly. Uh, so we found that uh, 380 such, uh, there were 380 self-signed certificates that had the same ECDSA R value. And as it turned out, this led to the discovery of an actual CVE, uh, specifically that certain Cisco hardware had insufficient entropy in the DRBG and ended up generating the same ECDSA blinding value. So in conclusion, uh, we introduced two properties to describe the uniqueness of certificates, uh, so of so uniqueness of certificate thumbprints. And in terms of these two properties, uh, we showed that with uh, weak hash functions, certificate thumbprints are not unique, and we provided examples of this. We looked for a way that this could be exploited in software, such as tricking software to accept a new certificate uh, when it had been presented, uh, an honest one, uh, previously with 
uh, the same thumbprint, but we did not find any examples of this. And we also searched for certificates with colliding MD5 or SHA-1 thumbprints uh, in internet scans, and we did not find any there either. So based on this work, we have a few recommendations. Specifically, that applications should uh, migrate their thumbprints to the stronger hash functions, SHA-256, 512. Um, if digest length is an issue, truncating a stronger algorithm to a shorter digest length is preferable to using a weak algorithm in this case. And uh, if you can't change the hash algorithm used for thumbprints, uh, use collision detection. And we would encourage projects monitoring PKIs, such as uh, certificate transparency, to check MD5 and SHA thumbprints, uh, SHA-1 thumbprints with collision detection as well. So also to any devs who are working uh, with certificates and certificate thumbprints, uh, you know, look for ways in your software that non-unique thumbprints could be used to exploit security. Because um, we obviously don't have visibility into all the places that thumbprints are used. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, you can check out the full version of the paper on the ePrint. In any um, hash collection um, situation, though collisions may be improbable, probabilistically, they can occur. I mean, the formula for that is well known, well documented, that you maximum population size, deploy population size, what's the probability of a collision? It may be probabilistically very low, but it is real. What happens thus if a collision occurs naturally in the, in the ring that you're doing? Probabilistically, it's unlikely. Probabilistically, it must be assumed that it will occur. Well, uh, so for the thumbprint case, I mean, the, the more critical case of this would be in, for the signing hash. So, uh, you know, so because the hash functions are defined in such a way that, you know, they would be, you know, at one time we're fine for signing. Uh, it's not, it wasn't not, that's not really as much of a concern in this case. So if you would get two certificates with the same thumbprint in terms of any collection? Yeah, so uh, you would have to have, it's uh, the square root of the total size of the mm -mm -mm -mm. range, right? Probably, the, uh, if you want, I'll give you the formula uh, offline. There is a formula for that that, you, that, 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 that is there for population of, of, of M, of N, M, M deployed, what's the probability of a collision? And it's, it's not the square root, it's, it's a different formula. Uh, so it's, it's different than the birthday? Oh, wow. it's much more realistic. You know, like what is the chance of a 1% collision? What's the chance of 100% collision okay. for that? Well, not, not, not was, was kind of, of, of a guaranteed collision. Well, yeah, we didn't, cut, we did not compute that probability, uh, but, you know, uh, it's a bigger problem for the signing hash, I would argue, and also, in that case, uh, we're more concerned about easy to compute collisions on these thumbprints. Yeah, so, um, I, it's probably my fault for not being up to date with this area of the literature, but you, you mentioned a couple of times checking for collision detection. Mm. Um, how do you do that? What does that mean? Oh, that's, uh, that was introduced by Mark Stevens uh, when analyzing f uh, the flame attack in uh, counter cryptanalysis. Uh, and basically what you can do is while computing an MD5 or SHA-1 hash, you can check uh, for differences in the message input blocks that would cause a collision. So you can, in fact, filter out inputs to hash functions that uh, are causing a collision while you're hashing just one of the objects. Cute, thank you. So those certificates you found with matching signatures, what's the story behind those? Uh, there is an extensive list of these in the, uh, in the full version. Um, there were versions that looked like uh, firewalls replacing certs uh, without 
sort of replacing the signature. Um, there were bugs. There were normal corruptions. There, there were many different reason, uh, reasons for this. Craig did a pretty extensive analysis of those. Cool. So, Thanks. No problem. Hi. Um, I wanted also to ask about the up here. I wanted also to ask about the, uh, the colliding uh, signatures. I was wondering, like, was this only old hardware, like in the case of mining P's and Q's, or is it also newer hardware? Uh, the Cisco one, I mean. The, the Cisco CVE that Greg found? You yeah, know? because my, so there was a similar situation for mining your P's and Q's where like uh, scanning RSA public keys, some shared one prime, and my understanding was be, that that was of, caused by low entropy during boot. Yeah, 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 and, yeah. Uh, yeah, the poor random number generation. Yeah, I was uh, wondering if that was also the, the cause. It's, yeah, it's, it's like a, in an abstract sense, it's like a similar cause, yeah, like root cause. But is the hardware any newer than that? Uh, did you look at ECDSA in the mining P's and Q's? The original paper. Just because recently I read something uh, like, oh, newer hardware doesn't have the problem of low entropy during boot. Um, so the, 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 actually we had a follow-up paper to P's and Q's and it was in 2016, Marcella, who gave it one of the talks earlier, was one of the co-authors. Um, and pe new vendors keep introducing the same flaws over and over again. Okay. Um, so it's never going away. All right, thank you. <laughs> Sorry to hijack. No, no, no. Um, so uh, we are over time, so let's thank Dan again. Do we have slides? I think we have slides. Okay, yeah. um, so our next talk will be uh, jointly presented by Christiane and Tiago. Okay, hello, everybody. Um, let me start with thanking the team at Aber and Ambro Bank for some of the inputs when we compiled this story. In particularly, I would like to thank Barbara and Jeroen. Barbara is here today, so feel free to seek her out and also ask her some questions. Before we dive into the case of Aber and Ambro Bank, I would like to put this into perspective and just give you a figure. That is, yearly surveys, you know, there's surveys on security on everything, but there's also an encryption, and this, there's a yearly survey, which basically stated for the last one that 45% of all large enterprises have a encryption and key management strategy that is consistently applied throughout the enterprise. So just to give you an idea, 45% of large enterprises encryption and key management. What we want to talk about is a crypto strategy that goes beyond encryption and key management. It contains it. And to show yeah, how we started from defining this uh, strategy to the implementation. And Tiago will start this off. Yeah. Thank you. So in 2016, which is when this story begins. I was the head of the crypto services team within Navy and Emerald. And when it came to cryptography, this is a little bit the situation that we have. First of all, we have a two-factor authentication system based on PKI for our corporate laptops, which makes us very proud. We've had it for many, many years. And I think that's a good thing. On not so good things, we have a central certificate management service which is basically a mailbox. So if you're a developer and you need a certificate, you have to send an email to our mailbox and there's some um, ping pong going back and forth and eventually, if, you're, if everything goes okay, you get your certificate. Generally speaking, this process would take about a week, one week to get a certificate. We also have a central key management service and the key management service is basically a very large and very secure three-factor authentication safe, and we have very good written procedures to access the key material inside of it. So I think this is actually quite secure, quite good on security front. It's not very scalable, and it's also painfully slow. Every time you needed to um, insert a key into some system, it's a process that would take at least half a day to a day, and multiple people would have to be involved. 
We also have a number of HSMs for our payment systems, so our core systems where our banking is, they, uh, we deal with HSMs, and our crypto services team is centrally managing those, so we know HSMs well. And also in 2016, uh, Google and Microsoft were basically saying, issuing a patch that was saying, enough is enough, no more SHA-1. So this that we're seeing here back in 2016, I think we're just doing the bare minimum and we needed a strategy. So in 2016, we gave IBM a call and said, okay, can you help us out here? And we created a crypto strategy, which in a nutshell was trying to create something like this. So in 2016, we're saying three years from now, this is what we're gonna have to do in a high level. And the uh, application side of cryptography is mostly about central services that would be delivered to the whole bank while the innovation side is mostly about capabilities that the bank must have, capabilities that might or might not be delivered from the central crypto services team. And then this is high level what we had back in 2016, and nowadays we have a much more comprehensive set of crypto uh, services, central crypto services, as well as capabilities implemented within the bank. Now, I don't want to bother you to death with all of this kind of stuff that we're currently doing, uh, but I think it would be really interesting to share some of the lessons learned that we had as we implemented this crypto strategy. And to do that, we're gonna share four stories. The first story is about SHA-1 migration. So that patch was coming along. If you have a certificate with SHA-1, it's no longer gonna work, so all we have to do as a bank is just migrate away from all of these certificates. So for that, we set up a task force. The first task force was looking for external facing certificates. And this was a relatively simple process. Uh, our, we know very well our external facing websites. Our most important ones were, uh, were using SHA-2 certificates now for years. So that was a relatively simple thing. We're talking about a few hundreds of systems. The problem became with the internal facing certificates. Because the internal facing certificates, we couldn't really rely on the inventory that we had. And that was because to get an internal facing certificate, you'd have to wait a week to get your certificate. So generally speaking, developers would try to bypass this process as much as humanly possible. And this created a huge amount of certificates which were really not uh, knowledgeable to us in the central uh, team. So what we had to do is to scan the entire network for certificates, trying to find what the certificates exist, which ones, are, which ones have SHA-1 on them. We'd have to do multiple passes of the scanner because some, some parts of the network you really couldn't access. And some certificates would appear in some scans but disappear in the next. Some certificates would appear multiple times in one scan, so how the hell did that happen? And we eventually had to set up a whole team of six or seven people that had to work on, these, uh, on this for well over a year. And just to give you an idea, this is one of the dashboards that we're sharing with one of our internal stakeholders. This is the magnitude of systems that we're talking about. Thousands of systems, uh, tens of thousands of certificates. Each, each one would be its own special little snowflake. So eventually we did it. We migrated away at a very painful way in a very high cost. So our lesson learned here was know where your crypto is and we can start with certificates. Because as, you, as organizations become more and more autonomous and we let teams become more and more autonomous, it's extremely important that the central team still knows where all of the different uh, instances of your cryptography are. Because when you wanna move, migrate away from something, whether that's certificates or anything else, then having the inventory makes a huge difference. Our second story is about HSMs. So you remember that we had the HSMs for our payment systems, we know those well, and in 2016 we decided to augment that, because we already have the HSMs for payment systems, those are fine and up and running and they work fantastically, so we can get network attached HSMs. The beauty about network attached HSMs is that they allow for an abstraction uh, layer for the developer. 
which generally speaking doesn't know cryptography that well. By providing that abstraction layer, we simplify their experience when it comes to cryptography and we incentivize them to use central services where the cryptographic operations are done in a central, in a, in a protected environment, as opposed to let them code the each single aspect of any kind of cryptography which they're using. Our lesson learned here was as much as possible, we have to try to make crypto easy to use and, and, and deploy, especially for our developers. The more, the easier you make the experience for developers, the more they will want to come to you and to use your central services. And nowadays what we have is a, a, a far more comprehensive set of uh, HS, um, it's just some solutions for all the different platforms that we use. And for that, will enable also us to have a much better key management service, which will feed from all of this. Now, for the third story, I'll hand over to Cristiano. Okay, thank you. So what you heard till now, key management, certificate management, that was operational. That was getting the basics right. But there was also the ambition, like, next time they didn't want to call me or my colleagues, but they want to say, can we do this ourselves? We need to have the knowledge in-house. We want to do consulting. We want to do in, uh, knowledge sharing. And we need to build this up. And that's kind of what we set out to do. We defined the skills. We found the people. And we, you know, went from a purely operational team to a team that can do consulting and advise the business. And one of the topics, you know, because... I like post-quantum cryptography. That's a topic I brought in there, and then people were like, whoa, SHA-1 was such a pain, this deprecation. We don't want to do this again. Should we start? When should we start? And the answer was, I said, we start now, right? So that's the answer. And uh, nowadays, there's a team of crypto consultants that works um, with the business, explains the issues to the business, prepares them mentally, right? I mean, it's just... Thing, but they also talk to um, academic researchers, industry researchers to find out, peel the polls, and just find out what is coming and not just wait for NIST to finish the standardization process. Because what we learned, crypto migrations take time and they're very costly. So I've seen the topic only once, you know, famous in, in, in industry, we talk a lot about this crypto agility at the moment. So what I want to explain here is that there's a lot of people shout for crypto agility, but for the bank, it actually means, for the enterprise, it means you need to do it end to end. You need to look at the whole stack. And what we learned from the migrations is maybe fairly simple to change something in a script, more complicated to go to applications, but if you go to S layer or all the way down to Hardware, it will be more costly, it will be more effort to do all this, right? So when we talk about we need some solutions, we need to prepare for the next move, it's not, you know, I don't think there's one solution that fits all. So we need to look at the whole stack and the whole landscape. And that's basically what the team is nowadays doing, doing and they're um, started with certificates, inventories, but they're also going further, inventorizing libraries and so forth. Last story is then, you know, ambitions were there already in 2016. And finally, it was like, we not only want to um, run our systems well, we don't want to just do some consulting, but the bank said, we want to do innovation. I said, okay, we want to do innovation. Okay, how do we set this up? And what we, we helped them to, to come up with was that we talked to the innovation department and we said, you know, you guys, in, the bank has an innovation department, you do... You talk to the business, you know what their problems are. We have now people in-house who know cryptography. You know, maybe we can bring you guys together, right? So it doesn't make really sense to have the operational team and the CISO organization to do innovation themselves, but it makes sense that they work together with the innovation department and um, try to look at what is actually needed and how can we bring cryptography um, to the use of the bank. And um, what they also do, and especially also the innovation department, is they go out and they talk to uh, researchers, both in academia and in industry, and try to find out solutions that 
then can be you know, developed and then applied and run as part of the security organization. And just something, we too, we can't get credit for this, but you just want to show this as an example, one of the, um, what, what came out of this strategy in this perception that finally you have to do something and crypto can do something for you is that the researchers in ABN AMRO, they uh, worked with, with a researcher, with industry researcher, that was IBM Research back then, and then later also with um, TNO and, and other banks together. And what they did, the use case is actually fraud detection. Yeah? The business, they don't care about cryptography, I'm very sorry, but they care about fraud detection at the bank. And they came up with clever algorithms, and they came even with a way to share insights with other banks running the same fraud detection algorithms, and they can do this with the magic of multi-party computation. So they can change, exchange information without revealing any um, confidential information about their own customers or uh, operations. So this is just an example from how you start with fixing your your basics to consulting, to innovation, and then what they did in research, actually then implementing it and making it work for the bank. And now we, we want to close off with what's next, right? Um, there's still a couple of things going on. So we mentioned post-quantum cryptography, crypto agility is on everyone's mind, but of course there's also a big push to go to, to public cloud to do DevOps. And that's where we try to say not only DevSecOps, but we want to have crypto properly used in, from the start. And um, the team is working hard and we're working with them together to get this right and prepare also how to use crypto securely in times of big data. That's it. Thanks mm -hmm. a lot. Thanks for your attention. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, sort of preparing for the uh, post-quantum crypto, and I'm wondering what are specific steps uh, you know, are you guys taking and what would you recommend to other enterprises uh, to do uh, in regards to that issue? So um, the first thing you have to do is, is uh, to have an inventory of, of uh, your to-do list, basically. And when it comes to post-quantum, there are two aspects of it, the symmetric cryptography, which we, you know, we're still waiting for NIST to, to standardize for everybody here at NIST. We're rooting for you. Please hurry up. And um, as for uh, symmetric cryptography, it's something that we can start doing already today by doubling the key length for, for, uh, for stuff. Um, so the, the, the thing that I could recommend for, for very large enterprises is the, the hardest part is likely going to be knowing, having your to-do list when it comes to, to asymmetric cryptography, which is not just specifically certificates. So start doing that, and as soon as NIST says, gives us the thumbs up, then we as an industry can start migrating away. Okay. So we're short on time, so let's thank uh, Christiane and Tiago again. Thank you. So our final talk of this session and the second talk in the enterprise crypto se uh, section of this session is going to be given by Gavin Watson. Okay, so um, thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Gavin Watson. I come from uh, Visa Research. And what I'm gonna talk today is about a threshold crypto scheme which was designed within Visa Research and we're in an ongoing effort to then take that to put it to the, the wider visa um, so that they can uh, use it with an enterprise setting. So what I'll talk about is how we can take this kind of theoretical construction and what we need to add to it to make it suitable to be used in such a setting. So I don't need to tell anyone in this room that encryption is important. Um, we all know that it's important. It gives us all jobs. Um, so what I will say is that one thing with encryption is what we're doing is we're taking data that we may have in plain text and we're encrypting it. So we're moving the risk from that data to the keys themselves. So now we just need to protect the keys to make sure that the data is secure. Um, but what that leaves us with is the problem of key management. So we heard a little bit about key management in the, in the last talk. 
And in the financial industry, it's important that sometimes we use HSMs, and key management kind of equates to, oh, we use an HSM for this. But if we consider the context of data arrest encryption, how is an HSM actually used? Well, in practice, we don't actually send all the data to this networked appliance HSM, because that's a lot of data we need to send across the network. Um, so what we employ is we have a key hierarchy. So we have a key encryption key, which is held inside the HSM. That key encryption key is going to be used to encrypt data encryption keys. So when I want to encrypt some data, if I don't have a data encryption key, I'm going to generate one in software. I'm going to use that to encrypt my data. And I'm going to make a call to the HSM to encrypt the data encryption key with the key encryption key. So then what I store longer term is the encrypted data along with this encrypted key. So the benefits of this approach is it's fast, because the actual encryption of the large amount of data is happening in software at the application. Um, and we get the benefit that we have hardware, protect, hardware protection um, of the keys thanks to the HSM. But the downside of this approach is that it still requires an expensive HSM, and that the data encryption key is left unprotected in memory um, when, it's, when it's not in use. Um, that might not seem too bad, because we're just encrypting a file, and then we immediately encrypt the, the key back under the keck. But in practice, that's not the case. It'll often be the case that I, I unwrap my data encryption key, and then I hold it in memory at my application for weeks at a time, encrypting large amounts of data. So during that kind of two-week period, it could, it's possible that the data encryption key is going to be exposed. Um, if we look at kind of the requirements for key management, which come from the kind of financial setting, um, so this is a quote from the PCI DSS document. So PCI is a payments card industry. So that's the body of all different major players within the uh, financial industry who define kind of what it means to be secure. Uh, the DSS is a specific document which is the data security standards. And requirement 353 that I'm highlighting here is <clears throat> what it tells us to do about key management. Um, so what are the things we need to do? We need to do some or, or all of these different things. So the first point is about this CAC deck that I just mentioned. The second point is maybe about using an HSM. And the third point is, well, if we're not using these, then we need to kind of distribute the, the keys so they're not held all together in one place. So what we want with this threshold encryption scheme, which we call DICE, is we want a pure software solution, um, but still with strong security. We're not just going to be holding keys uh, to be exposed in an application. We're using a threshold scheme, so these keys are going to be distributed. So DICE is the, the solution we have for this. So where DICE stands for Distributed Symmetric Encryption. OK, so DICE was originally published by some of my colleagues at CCS uh, in 2018. Um, so Peter and Peyman are, are here today. Um, it was also presented at the NIST workshop on threshold cryptography uh, last year. Um, so if you were at either of those two previous talks, you would have got kind of the technical details about DICE. I don't have time to go into the full technical details, so I'll just give a high level and then move on to talk about kind of the deployment challenges when we're taking such a scheme to use it within an enterprise setting. So here's the high level overview of DICE. So as I mentioned, it's a threshold encryption scheme. So it means is we have a collection of nodes. We distribute the key, the master key, across those nodes. Each, each node's getting a different share of that key. When an application or a user wants to encrypt some data, what's going to happen? So I want to encrypt some data D. I'm going to do a cryptographic commitment to that data that I want to encrypt. I then send uh, these commitments out to a threshold number of the nodes in the network. Those, each of those nodes together with their key share, calculate some new value. And actually what's happening here is we're calculating, a, we're performing a distributed PRF. And you can even in fact view this as a distributed key derivation. Um, and so DICE itself has two different um, modes. Uh, one which is based on using AES, and another one which is based on elliptic curve cryptography. As I mentioned earlier, if you want the full details, I refer you to the paper or come and talk to one of us um, after the talk. Um, so yeah, so once these nodes have done this calculation, they send these parts back to the, the, the encryptor of the, the data. They can then reform this into an ephemeral, one-time, data-specific key. So this key is going to be tied to the data that we are performing, we are encrypting. We then use this to encrypt the data itself. So the ciphertext is now going to be composed of this encrypted data, along with that commitment we, we calculated earlier, because we're going to need that commitment later when we want to do decryption, because decryption will just be the same thing. We do this distributed PRF to re recalculate the key to then do the decryption later. So benefits of this approach is that the master key always remains distributed. 
It never needs to be recombined at any time. It's a threshold encryption scheme. It's secure against a T minus one, so it's up to one less than the threshold number of um, parties. As long as they are no more than that are compromised, we're still gonna be secure. Um, as a very small network cost, because again, we're not sending the full data across these nodes, we're just sending this very small cryptographic commitment. And on the other side of that, because we're just sending the cryptographic command, we get data privacy. None of these nodes will ever learn what I'm encrypting, because I only ever have that full data back at my application where I'm going to encrypt the data. Okay, so in terms of performance, if we look at the AES-based version of uh, DICE, we get really good figures in terms of the performance. And um, there's a much more detailed um, kind of figures in the, in the paper if you want more details, but here's just one example of one of the setups we did. And here we get really good figures. You can see throughput, throughput of a million encryptions per second and a latency of half a millisecond per encryption. If we wanted to compare DICE with other approaches, so first of all, going back to the HSM story, um, so because it's a pure software solution, it's cheaper and more scalable than HSMs. If we compare it to secret sharing, which we heard a little bit about earlier today, um, the benefit of DICE is we don't need to recombine that master key. To do our encrypt-decrypt operation, the master key will always remain distributed. And then comparing to MPC, um, because we're just doing this distributed key derivation and then actually encrypting our data locally, we can get much better performance than you would with, with MPC. Okay, so that's a very high level, very quick um, overview of DICE. So now I want to talk about, well, what are the things we've needed to add to our kind of academic code of DICE to make it something which is usable um, in an enterprise setting. So going back to the story of key management, which again we heard in the previous talk, um, so we can have some nice funky crypto which allows us to generate the master key in a distributed fashion so no one ever learns the full key. Um, but in practice, we may need some other functions around that. So we may need to be able to import and export master keys from the system. Consider we have a deployment of DICE in North America and we have another deployment in Europe. So they're both gonna be encrypting, decrypting the same data, but they're gonna be doing that in different places. They need the same master key. So you're not gonna be able, need to be able to import the master key from one system to export it from one system to import it into the other. So you're gonna need extra functions that allow you to do that. You may, in some sense, if you're, if you're very prudent, you might want to export it so you can take a backup of that master key in some other secure location. From an interoperability perspective, because in any large enterprise we have many different systems, we're gonna to need to be able to migrate from some system into the DICE network using these different keys. We might need to later migrate data out of being encrypted using DICE to encryption under some other system. So we're gonna to need to be able to have flows which allow us to do that in a, in a nice, easy fashion. And then finally, because it's the compliance, because it's the financial industry, we really compare about compliance. And going back to that PCI standard, sometimes we really need to tick that box that's saying we have a hardware root of trust. It might seem contradictory to what I've said already, but maybe in some instances we give, need to talk, tick that box for the auditor, and it could be as simple as that the master key backup is held within some secure hardware. The next deployment reality, authentication and authorization. So I saw in my, in my high level kind of depiction of DICE, we have this user calling into the network to perform an encrypt or a decrypt. But really, we have to check that this is a person that's permitted to making these, making these calls. Um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to authenticate them. And we can just do that based on standard practices. So give that person a client-side certificate, and then they're authenticated based on the mutual TLS channel that they establish. But then once they're authenticated, what are they permitted to do? So one thing we can do in terms of authorizing what they can do is that in that commitment we calculate um, for DICE when we commit to the data we are being, we're encrypting, we can also commit to an identity of a user which will be later permitted to perform the decryption. And in that time of decryption, the DICE nodes can check that that user calling to do a decryption is the permitted user. One of the other things we can do is that sometimes in an enterprise setting we have many different applications and we need to separate them within different key zones. So different applications are permitted to use different keys. They have different master keys for DICE, let's say. So at the time of them making the call, we need to check whether they're authorized to use the master key that they're calling to, the particular set of DICE nodes that they're calling for. Next point, API and connection management. So when designing any cryptographic API, 
we have to bear in mind it's not going to be used by experts, not going to be used by cryptographers necessarily. So we want it to be really simple to use. So we want a really minimal API. So from this perspective, to some extent, all we really want it to say is uh, do encrypt or, or do decrypt. We don't want it, the, the developer to have to understand that you're making calls to these T different dice nodes to then regather these together to calculate some ephemeral key, which we're going to use. That should all be hidden behind in, in the library um, that's, that's going to be helping you with that. But then the library itself, because it's making calls to these many different dice nodes, it needs to be able to manage all those connections. It needs to know who it's talking to and where it's reaching out to. Um, so what we do with dice is we add this additional entity, which we call a, a broker. Um, so this connection broker, you can think of like a phone directory or maybe even like a DNS server. So that's basically just going to help you. You can reach out to it, and it tells you where the, D the dice nodes are that you need to reach out to, which dice nodes are currently live. It might help in the future with some, some load balancing. Um, so then with that information, back at the library, it can reach out to the appropriate dice nodes to then perform the distributed uh, key derivation. But of course, if we're adding in this broker, we don't want it to be a single point of failure. We don't want the dice nodes to be single points of failure. So firstly, in terms of dice itself, we need to set the appropriate threshold. So we need to set the right amount of uh, dice nodes themselves, and we need to set them up with an appropriate threshold that it's going to give us a, a good level of security. We need some redundancy in the broker. Um, we don't want the broker to go down, and then the application doesn't know where any dice nodes are that it needs to contact. So we need some redundancy there. And then the final point, which is maybe a little bit funky. So we want to create a varied attack surface. So we have many different dice nodes. If I'm an attacker and I want to break into the dice system, I need to break more than a threshold number of these nodes. So if I kind of make these, dice, these nodes very different, then he's going to need to perform different attacks on different nodes to be able to break the whole system. So I could have some nodes which are Windows servers, some which are Linux servers, and so it's going to be much harder for him to, to break into it. The, kind of, the practical issue with this is that it makes it much harder for system administrators. They now have a much more diverse landscape they need to manage, so it might be a pain point for them to, to do that in practice. Okay, so that's kind of some of the, the realities we faced when working with uh, <clears throat> the actual teams that use these systems in practice. So we're currently ongoing in terms of getting this up and running so we can get a look at and use really in an enterprise setting. Um, we're also working internally through our processes to be able to open source this. So hopefully in a month or so, I should have some positive news, and we can share it with you guys, and you, you, guys, and you can also have a play at, uh, at using our, our threshold encryption scheme. Um, so thanks, and any questions? Thank you, Gavin. Um, is there any interest in this kind of context of uh, adding key rotation functionality where you either change the data encryption keys or the key encrypting keys? And what kind of techniques do you have in place for that? Yeah, so there's obviously that would be a very useful thing to have. Um, it's not something we necessarily have at the moment. Um, as I mentioned, we have kind of two types of dice. There's the AES-based one and there's the elliptic curve-based one. So the elliptic curve-based one, maybe there is some scope for doing something there. On the AS-based one, it might be more complicated. That would need some more thought. And, and have you done a risk analysis that says this kind of diversity of platforms reduces the risk compared to using an HSM? And if not, how do you kind of persuade the business that this is the right way to go for your architecture? Um, that's a good question. We've not done any kind of concrete analysis of that. Um, but I think they see some, some uh, validity in, in this approach. They're maybe not going to do it for every single project, um, but for some projects they see that as something which would be useful. Hello, thanks for the talk. Um, you mentioned one of the things with deployment is if you can you know, get into a threshold of servers, then you can attack the system. Um, and you also mentioned using like different platforms like Windows, Linux, and such. Um, I suspect you're probably using some sort of shared library for the cryptographic implementation. So if you're shipping projects like that, how do you ensure that um, that library itself is not compromised and then shipped alone where it could start you know, sending off uh, keys to other places? 
That, that is a good, yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily have a good answer to that. You could have different implementations of the library, different implementations of DICE, so you have different versions of the library, which then gives you that additional level of complexity. But again, practically, that's kind of an issue because then you're managing much more different versions of the library. Let's all thank Gavin again. And let's thank all the speakers of this wonderful session. And that concludes our program for today.